I do. So my name's Doug Miller, and I have the pleasure of interviewing Susan Eisenhower. The book is How Ike Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. I know that it says we're only here for 45 minutes, but of all the interviews I have done over uh, the last two or three days, I have the most notes and the most questions about this one. <laughs> it's fascinating. If you haven't bought it and you haven't read it, please go get it. So I told him we're going to spend two hours instead of 45 minutes, <laughs> uh -oh. but anyway, we'll see how that goes. Um, and, and just a little background on Susan. She's a consultant, an author, a policy strategist. She works on national security issues. She lectures on strategic leadership all over the country and around the world. And she's related to uh, Ike. She's one of the four grandchildren. So she has an incredible insight on her grandfather, both from the research she does and then from some interactions that we'll talk about. So I, I kind of want to jump right into why you wrote this book. But first, I, I wanted to talk about, have you <coughs> talk about the dedication. The dedication is I dedicate this book to my strategy and leadership students at the Eisenhower Institute at Gettysburg College. So tell us what the Eisenhower Institute and what Gettysburg College is in relationship to that and why that was so special to your grandfather? <clears throat> well, the Eisenhower Institute was founded by a number of my grandfather's presidential associates. Actually, there were some wartime associates as well. And I was the uh, first president of the Institute, so I was a co-founder as well. We uh, later merged with uh, Gettysburg College to focus on rising generations. And the Eisenhower Institute really serves as a bridge between the academic world and the world of work. Uh, I, I have had 120 students go through my uh, boot camp on strategy and strategic leadership, and I'm very proud of uh, the fact that a number of them have ended up on strategy committees at major organizations, which is really gratifying. And, and why was Gettysburg important to your grandfather? Well, Gettysburg is where he retired, but actually, during World War I, a lot of people uh, said, well, he, didn't, uh, he wasn't in combat in France. Actually, he was doing uh, something that was equally important. He was the first tank commander um, in, in our armed forces. Um, and being the first tank commander gave him an intimate understanding of the role the tanks would play in warfare. Uh, and so he was there in 1917, 1918. By the way, managed the Spanish flu influenza outbreak uh, at Camp uh, Colt and, and got a Distinguished Service Medal at the age of 27 years old, which is really quite extraordinary for both his leadership at Camp Colt and also uh, the management of uh, something that uh, the Army didn't even want to admit was underway, which was that pandemic. Um, and Eisenhower's formula for how to keep that pandemic under control ends up being best practices for the United States military. Uh, during that time. So after the presidency, he looked at a number of places to retire, and they had, uh, there were lots of reasons to go back, but that being one of them. We could talk about his connection here to the desert, but I, I really want to jump into the book because it's so fascinating. So tell us why this book and why now? Well, I actually wasn't intending to, to write this book. I had a very aggressive agent who I ran into on the street, and he said, what's your next book? And I said, I'm, you know, I've got a lot of consulting work to do, and you know, the world is a mess, and foreign policy was my area. And he said, no, 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 well, then what are you going to write in the future? And I said, well, before I die, I'm going to write a book about Eisenhower's strategic leadership. And he pulls me into a coffee shop, and he says, I want 50 pages by Wednesday. <laughs> and, and I was always slightly intimidated by him, so I said, OK. And I went home and wrote 50 pages, and it became the proposal, and he sold it almost immediately. And then I thought, oh, my. I am writing a book now. How am I going <laughs> to fit that into my schedule? But I, no, in all seriousness, um, we were having a number of anniversaries, the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, um, the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, D.C., that is located next to the Air and Space Museum, was being dedicated that September. So it seemed like a good, and we were going into a presidential election. So it seemed like a good time. So tell us a little bit about the dedication of the Eisenhower Memorial. Well, you know, if you Google this and Google my name, you'll see that uh, I ended up being the family whipping boy for 
having some objections to uh, the design um, and the theme. And just to say, finally, it's a Frank Gehry um, uh, design memorial. Um, but uh, the, and, and design is very subjective, so you know, we weren't gonna have any influence over that. But what we did end up having some influence over was the theme. The theme was going to be a little boy from Kansas looking at his future. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I thought, no, wait a minute. Um, I don't think he dreamed about liberating concentration camps or looking men in the eyes who he thought might not come back. Uh, we had to have a more monumental theme. Or I told members of Congress, then let's just not do it. And they were like, you're kidding. You mean you're willing to give this up without a, uh, a change in the theme? And I said, yeah. And so um, actually a behind the scenes effort converted this. And now if you go to Washington, you see this memorial, guess what's behind Eisenhower the general and Eisenhower the president? The beaches of Normandy in peacetime. But boy, I'll tell you, I've got the scars on my back. But you know, um, <clears throat> how you remember historic events is the most, uh, the most aggressively thought, uh, fought issues in Washington because it's the way parties associate themselves and create, uh, and everyone creates a dialogue for the future based on how we remember the past. So I guess it was worth the fight, but I haven't quite recovered. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you said you wanted to write a book on his leadership before you passed away. Why was that important? Well, I don't think, um, uh, I spent a lot of time traveling to uh, countries that had uh, authoritarian regimes uh, for the Department of Energy and for the Department of Defense, et cetera. And the, the key thing I knew from that experience is if you know something that other people don't know, you have an obligation to tell it, which is why many years ago I wrote a book about uh, Mamie Eisenhower uh, because she's been very much underestimated. Anyway, Eisenhower's strategic leadership is important because he used a set of tools in his strategist toolbox that we don't use today. The whole idea that you'd work behind the scenes and put other people forward as a way to accomplish your goals is actually very sophisticated, especially by today's standards. Um, and so I wanted people to understand that there is more than one way to achieve your objectives. And actually the way he chose was a way that would continue to make it possible for him to bring people together and to um, advance his um, agenda uh, so that everyone could be a winner. Do you know, after a two-term presidency, he passed 80% of his administration's legislation in a Democrat-controlled Congress. And he did that by breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Lyndon Johnson and Sam Rayburn and the other leaders up on Capitol Hill. And then he would work through others if things got dicey to make sure that he was always the person uh, that could resolve the situation. So was this a hard book to write? Um, you know, I, I make cameo appearances in the book, um, but generally speaking, um, on the one hand, it wasn't difficult because certainly in the national security area, uh, I knew where to look uh, for my sources. I know the field, and so that wasn't so difficult. I had to brush up rapidly on some of the domestic things. Um, so that was fine, and also, I just have to say, everybody, you know, thanks mom and dad, seriously, but they taught us to be completely compartmentalized. They said, you know, you're gonna grow up, you're gonna hear people who don't like your grandfather at all, they're going to be critical, and just let it roll off your back. This has nothing to do with you, this is him. Um, but if they tell you that uh, he's not a good guy or uh, something that's counter to what you remember about him as your grandfather, then fight that fight if you want to. So it wasn't, that part of it wasn't hard, but the reason I was gonna wait until I died before I uh, wrote this book is it was gonna be my goodbye. Um, and it was gonna be my goodbye because uh, like all families like this, our identities are so interwoven. And so, yeah, there were two chapters in there that were very hard to write. And I still get a little bit weepy on the last chapter. That doesn't sound very professional, but um, I do make cameo appearances in that chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I wanna structure this a little like the book is structured, and that is 
talk about what his core principles were of leadership, kind of pre presidency during the, the war years and during his presidential years and then go through some of the most difficult and incredible decisions he had to make right. and have you demonstrate again how his principles helped him through those. So I, I, I was struck by two words that you use to describe kind of his leadership style and maybe you can expound on those. You talk about he had a middle way. What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, I had fun in the book because I thought I would spare the reader. It's, I, it's an attempt at a really readable book on this subject. So instead of um, trying to educate the writers about um, all of the senators who were giving him a hard time, or uh, mostly in his own party, by the way, I, I thought I would tell um, th uh, the story of that through his own experience. He was a middle child. Um, and he had an uh, older brother who was really quite right-wing and very dominating, and a younger brother who was really quite liberal. So Ike spent his entire childhood trying to keep everybody serene and happy and these two brothers, you know, um, pulling in the same direction. So it was unnatural that he was a lifelong centrist. Uh, as a matter of fact, after the war, nobody knew what political party he belonged to, and he didn't tell anybody. And uh, Democrats came calling, Republicans came calling, and this went on all the way up until just before uh, the Republican convention. Uh, nobody even knew he was a Republican. Uh, Harry Truman had volunteered to step aside twice to give Eisenhower the opportunity to run for president as a Democrat. So the middle way was absolutely in his genetic code. Um, you know, and uh, by the way, I'm a middle child too, and that's my job description with my generation is to keep everyone jollied along, right? Um, but um, so that was, um, he, think, he believed deeply that the middle ground was the only place you could bring everyone together. Um, and uh, I, in a very prescient way, he predicts that unless things change, uh, the voices from the extreme right and the extreme left will be the only voices heard um, in the public square. Can you imagine? He wrote that, you know, back in 1947. Um, did, did he have a different leadership style as a general as opposed to a president? Well, I'm really glad you, Doug, thank you for that question because actually what I tried to demonstrate is that Eisenhower the general was also Eisenhower the president, that this is the same person. Uh, so if you think of what his job description was during the war, it was to keep a really fractious alliance together. But make no mistake, this wasn't uh, a, a congeniality contest here. He was the man who devised the strategy for um, the Western victory in the European theater. It's Eisenhower who expands the force size for D-Day. It's Eisenhower who decides on a broad front through Europe uh, to defeat the Nazis as opposed to this um, single uh, piercing strike that the British favored. Um, so uh, he was ready to take that responsibility. Um, and I would say a core principle of his was self-sacrifice. Now, this may sound corny, but let's just remember, this is a West Point graduate. When you go to West Point, you are saying that I'm going to sacrifice my life for something bigger than yourself. Um, and Eisenhower, uh, might surprise you, uh, came from a um, German Mennonite household, German-American Mennonite household, um, of pacifists. Um, and, uh, and he, he went was, to West Point. And went to West Point for the free education. <laughs> um, and, and so he had to reconcile his own upbringing with what he was g going to do. But the one thing that was not in contradiction was this belief in serving something larger than yourself. Um, and he comes to the White House as originally a registered independent and then decides to hitch his five stars to the Republican Party to bring it out of obscurity after the Great Depression uh, because he believed that the future of the country depended on a vibrant two-party system. So I love books that surprise me, things mm -hmm. that I don't know, facts I don't know. Um, I love this book because my father was this generation, so it gave me some insight into to his and my mother's life at that time period, my grandparents. But there was something that was so intrigued me, and it's for D-Day, 
he wrote a letter to himself that he kept, and maybe you can tell us about it. Well, um, it's called um, uh, it's called all kinds of things, um, but it is in case of failure, communique. Uh, and if the D-Day landings had failed, he was planning to release it to uh, the press, and a smart thing to write that before you're in the turmoil of an event like that. Um, but it basically says that the, um, uh, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, uh, paratroopers um, did everything that uh, devotion to duty could do, that they were well-trained. Uh, uh, but he said, if, if the invasion fails, the responsibility is mine alone. So he put this in his wallet, and about a month later, um, Harry Butcher, who was keeping the headquarters diary, insisted on extracting this letter and putting it into the public record, and Ike didn't want to give it up. Uh, because the invasion had not failed, and he didn't want people to think he was trying to be a hero or something by saying that. It was very personal to him. He also apparently had written a case, in case of failure, communique for every major invasion uh, prior to D-Day, so um, this seemed natural to him. And he had fought for the expansion of um, uh, a larger Omaha beach, and Utah beach was entirely his idea, so uh, people were going um, up the um, French coast on his concept. And of course you're not gonna blame other people for that. Um, but it, um, I think the thing that moved me most is that dropping those paratroopers was highly risky because the Germans had moved a division into the area. Um, and his um, chief expert on the commander of the airborne forces begged him not to use the airborne troops. Uh, he decided after, you know, going through the strategy that uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't retain Utah Beach and get those guys off the beaches uh, without using paratroopers to secure the causeways. And yet, knowing that between es the estimates that between seven, 50 and 70 percent of those men would be lost on June 5th as they were boarding planes to go to their uncertain future in Normandy he went out to the airfield and looked every one of those young men in the eyes so you know that famous picture where he's looking very stern like this as he's talking to these paratroopers do you know what he's talking about I know because number 23, the tall paratrooper there, lived to tell the tale, and I met him. And I said, oh, please, tell me what were you talking to General Eisenhower about? He said, oh, no, General Eisenhower asked me where I was from. I said, Michigan. He said, I love going to Michigan. There's great fly fishing there. <laughs> <laughs> so look at that picture again. His jaws so set because he's expressing his enthusiasm for fly fishing. So I later said to my father, why fly fishing, you know, just before these guys go, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, land and open up the causeways and actually, you know, are the leading operation of the D-Day invasion. And, and my father said, because these kids were scared to death. And it was just a way to say, we've got your back, you're going to come home, we're going to go fly fishing again, this is going to be over. And I think that was very, that was very moving for me. So yesterday we had a conversation and it wasn't something I had thought about asking you. Um, you mentioned his brothers and they <laughs> didn't hesitate to write to him and tell him he was wrong. And be and a little should, bossy, and, by the and way. And be pretty no. bossy to him. <laughs> and then if you think of the decisions he had to make as the supreme commander in the military, the supreme commander as president, he had to ultimately make those decisions. And, and you talked about the loneliness aspect of that. Can you share that with us? Well, you know, um, I think this is where I could be an observer um, that maybe other scholars, you know, might read about various periods. But I, I just want to say one thing that was really important, and I guess I've got my granddaughter hat on now. Um, as I got older and started reading um, about his uh, his tenure as, as leaders, and I, I couldn't escape it. I mean, if you're in the foreign policy field, he, he's everywhere. Even in the domestic field, we've got an internet, uh, interstate highway system. All of the early key decisions on civil rights were his. 
He was the first person since uh, Reconstruction to pass a piece of legislation in civil rights. Uh, two, two, two bills, as a matter of fact. Um, and, and all of those great accomplishments, he's everywhere. But I, I think it was uh, just very important for me to, um, you know, in a compartmentalized way, look at how he got that done and how he managed always to be optimistic. I never heard a pessimistic word come out of his mouth at the dining room table. He never trashed the opposition. Um, he was always, um, uh, he, he, was, he was certain that us kids were going to change the world. And as he said to his wartime, one of his wartime colleagues, he says, I think it's our responsibility to get things sorted out after this war, to bring financial um, prosperity to our country and to give the younger folks a chance to work for world betterment. Um, I think, um, and this is where I think I can underscore again, I never saw him cynical. I never saw him hardened by his responsibilities and I still can't figure out how he did it. I cannot figure out how he did it except sheer self-discipline because you know he had to be worried and anxious about things too. But as he said during the war, a commander's job is to go out and exude optimism because people will not go into combat if they think they're going to lose before they start. And um, he carried that with him all his life. So I want to talk about some of the ways he led when he had difficult decisions. A president nominates those judges to the federal court and to the Supreme Court. But he had a unique philosophy, one that I admire <laughs> because I'm a judge and I, I appreciate the approach he take, took. So tell us a little bit about it because it's very unique for those of us who watch what happens now in the hearings. Well, if it's all right, I'd like to just put down two basic principles that make being president extremely difficult. We, as far as I know, we are the only country on the planet that expects our president of the United States to be head of state, uh, head, of uh, head of the executive branch, and head of his political party. Um, in other countries, they have that disaggregated in various ways. Um, and then if you, um, and so Eisenhower decided to lead as a head of state and head of the ex executive branch and left a lot of the, um, uh, he worked through others to get the Republican Party straightened up after this long period in the wilderness. Um, and so the other uh, thing that's important to know is that he believed deeply in three co-equal branches of government. This is one reason why he took a b under the radar screen um, strategy for sorting out uh, the Joe McCarthy problem. Now there are a lot of people who say he should have ascended the bully pulpit, but nobody knew better than Dwight Eisenhower that the President of the United States did not control the Senate of the United States. That he would have to work quietly to persuade the other Republicans to um, censure um, you know, uh, Senator McCarthy, who had undertaken all kinds of hearings that were creating huge divisions. So with that background, um, you know, a belief in, in um, the, th the three branches of government especially, he felt that America's confidence in the judiciary was critical because in so many ways it's, it's the last arbiter of, um, you know, contentious situations. And so he, uh, there were two principles that he operated under. Um, segregationists need not apply to the federal bench with Dwight Eisenhower as president. And number two, which is really, um, sounds like ancient history or something, he believed that the courts had to be ideologically balanced. Um, and to the extent that even um, in his election year, um, in 1956, he appointed William Brennan to the Supreme Court, a Catholic Democrat, because he believed that the court was not sufficiently ideologically balanced. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and among the things that his attorney general um, was most proud of was that the Eisenhower administration at the federal bench level had 
um, had, had uh, established that kind of uh, ideological balance in their co court appointments, and no segregationists had been given that nod. Um, and so this is all behind the scenes, it's under the radar, and it's just the sort of thing that the American people didn't pick up on, but it did make things like progress in civil rights and other things possible because uh, there was, um, you know, a, a balanced court and a court that uh, did not believe that um, uh, freedom was confined only to certain segments of our population. And, and we'll get to the civil rights um, because he also appointed Earl Warren, which Earl was Warren. very important in that aspect. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to Sen Senator McCarthy just for a moment because <laughs> it illustrates a principle that you and I talked about, and that is he didn't confront it head on, and he knew what he could control and what he couldn't control. Tell us a, a little bit about that aspect of his leadership. Well, what you can control and what you what you can control and what you can't control is a very big part of strategic thinking. Think of how many people stand up and say that they want to do this, but they're never going to be able to do it because they don't control the levers to make it happen. And uh, I think not only do you see that um, in uh, Joe McCarthy's situation, where they had a full-blown under-the-radar strategy to bring this guy to heel, uh, but you also see it in civil rights, because by the end of the Eisenhower administration, his objective, and he says it um, on the campaign trail, and he says it in his major speeches, the State of the Union address, his inaugural address, his objective is to desegregate everything the federal government controls. Um, even before Brown versus Board of Education, which is the landmark um, Supreme Court ruling um, on uh, desegregation, Eisenhower had already desegregated Washington, D.C. He'd already done that, and he did it because the federal government controlled Washington, D.C. By the end of his administration, he had desegregated federal contracting, uh, he had desegregated um, the military. I know that that was a, a Truman measure, but um, it was General Eisenhower, now the president, who actually implemented that big time and desegregated um, uh, Department of Defense schools. And it goes on and on like this, but um, that, that job um, and what he did there is what I called creating a beachhead. And he got his troops on shore with these uh, two pieces of civil rights legislation in 57 and 60, 1960. Um, so what you control is very important. Where it got tricky was when the states were involved because we still had, you know, states had jurisdiction over schools and other things. And so as you well remember, he sent the 101st Airborne Division to Little Rock, Arkansas. So sometimes people say, uh, do you think your grandfather was serious about civil rights? And I said, well, the 101st Airborne Division did D-Day. <laughs> they, uh, they, they landed uh, near Carenton on the Normandy coast, and I would say that um, the 101st Airborne Division in his book was right up there with the 82nd Airborne. These are the guys who were pivotal. Um, and, and so uh, it was with great regret that he had to send American uh, troops to... Um, an American city, federal troops, um, but he was um, implementing um, their, his constitutional obligations um, and uh, believed in the idea of overwhelming force. You use overwhelming force and you never have the kinds of casualties you do if you use relatively untrained National Guard or others. So w one other thing that surprised me was about the YouTube and it being shot down over Russia. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it was interesting that he described the three most demanding weeks of his presidency when he had to deal with Egypt and the Suez Canal, he had to deal with Hungary and all that was going on there, and then the downing of the U-2 spy plane. Right. So talk to us a little bit about that. Well, um, And I think he'd, he'd suffered a heart attack and wasn't feeling up to par either at that time period, if I well, have Well, right. this is such a, a, such a rich area. I'll say very quickly about Suez and the Hungarian uprising. Uh, both of those things occurred um, during the election campaign of 1956, so he was running for re-election. 
Suez involved um, a kind of betrayal, you could say, not just of international law, but a betrayal to the United States by our wartime allies, Great Britain, France, and Israel. And I'll tell you, you didn't mess with, uh, with Ike. He was as tough as he had to be when he had to be it, though I would add that he had a, a, an enormous heart. I, that's the Susan Eisenhower <laughs> part that I can say. But, you know, uh, he told my father, my father conveyed it to me, and he wrote to one of his childhood friends that um, if I lose the election over Suez, so be it. I mean, he, you remember, this sounds so um, sort of unbelievable, but he was, not a he was not a retail politician. His job was to secure the future of our country, an uh, oath he made at West Point at the age of, you know, 20. And, um, and uh, this continued his whole life. So the, hung the, Hungary, uh, the Hungarian uprising and Suez were big. The U2 was very big um, as well. And, um, you know, that was um, something he had been uh, working on for um, a long time. But the U-2 was what one Russian once said to me was unilateral open skies. We had already offered the Soviet Union the opportunity to overfly our territory uh, to verify whether anyone was on the verge of a surprise nuclear attack. And, um, and the uh, Soviet Union declined. Uh, to participate in that, um, and so we went ahead and did it anyway, and it saved a tremendous amount of money in overbuilding um, our military uh, because there were all sorts of calls to uh, go crazy with military spending, and Ike believed that there were three corners of our national security. Number one, our, and, and not necessarily in order of importance, but but uh, key was our capability, military capability. The other was the state of our economy, and the third was our moral standing in the world. Um, and as part of this, the economy always played into um, his strategy. That's what strategy is about, is aligning your financial resources with your objective. But with the U2, he, he again took responsibility for it rather than so tell us a little bit about okay, that, because so I, he, he I think it so shows his character and, and, and who he was. Well, first of all, the, the government, um, and, and he ran a very tight ship there. He organized the White House, much like the way headquarters during the war was organized. Um, so he had, um, he had his Montgomery and his uh, Omar Bradley and all the same kind of personalities on his, in his White House cabinet. He liked the pushback. He loved the pushback. It helped him make decisions. So uh, yes, uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just running down a rabbit <laughs> hole here. But, the, but to me, the, the YouTube, YouTube episode kind of shows. Oh the yeah, the responsibility. Yeah. So um, the the way the uh, government was organized then, um, you know, the uh, the uh, department that was responsible for you know the the YouTube program. Um, had a, a, an explanation in case such a thing should go down. He was assured by the CIA that, that nobody, um, uh, that the plane would break up uh, in midair and that there would be no, no trace of this should it go down. So he was um, misled on that. Um, what happens is that um, the, there was an internal investigation, uh, uh, an emergency internal investigation. Uh, and after that was concluded, um, he did accept responsibility for it because he said that he didn't want the Soviet Union to think that he wasn't in charge of his own government. So to be making excuses for himself would only be inviting our adversary to think that the President of the United States didn't have the power or authority to order or not order this. Um, and so there's a lot of, of course, that's a controversy in history, um, but I think he did the right thing. You don't want your enemy to think that... Uh, uh, you've got lower orders of your government freelancing out there. Of course, he had to take responsibility for it, and he did. So we talked yesterday about some aspects of your kind of looking at this book now that you wished you would have emphasized more. <laughs> and, and I think I explained it to you, and Dave Chapman will relate to this, that my best closing arguments when I was a trial lawyer were on my way home, home from the court. You know? <laughs> so, so we, we talked about 
and, and you kind of phrased it that Eisenhower was the first in so many aspects. That's the first part we talked about. And then you equated it to something I thought was so interesting called sustainable leadership. So if maybe you can emphasize what those firsts were and... and well, as I, 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 told, I warned you all, I'm uh, fully compartmentalized, okay? So this is Susan the Analyst saying this. Uh, the, the two things that shocked me uh, um, was just tying together all of these high-stress moments with the person I knew at the dining room table. That was a little bit of a merger there. But um, in looking at what I um, admire of him as an analyst, first of all, the way he organized his, his government and the way he treated people and all of those things. He was an amateur um, painter. He painted portraits of all of his associates and gave it to them as little gifts and designed jewelry for my grandmother. I mean, what's not to like here? But actually, as an analyst, you have to say, okay, think about this, says Susan. The major things that he dealt with, he was the first to do it. It just occurred to me one day, he was the first tank commander at Camp Colt. There was no job description for being a tank commander. He was the first supreme commander of allied forces of a, a multinational integrated force. Never in history had that existed before. He was the first commander of NATO. NATO hadn't been militarized. It was the first time anybody had done that job. He was the first president of the hydrogen bomb era and it was during that time that the architecture for how to think about nuclear deterrence and other things was created in his administration. He was the first president of the space age. The first president of the space age. There was no architecture for space. It wasn't clear whether um, sovereign airspace extended all the way out into the cosmos. Th there was no law on that. And by standing back and letting the Soviet Union launch Sputnik first, he cornered them into verifying freedom of space, and it was all deliberate. He took the political hit to get the Soviet Union to verify that space would be free because they refused overflights of the Soviet Union. And had they figured out that we already had a satellite reconnaissance program in the works, they might not have wanted to launch their satellite first. It was all done by um, a uh, multilateral agreement. So, I mean, you're thinking, uh, what would it be like to be the first to do something? So he was, I think this was at the two areas of genius, says Susan the Analyst, is one, this capacity to envision a whole. And the second, and, and then to figure out what would be necessary for this job description to affect a certain end. And then I would say the other thing that he was a genius at was knowing when to deploy his ego and when to suppress it. Because he showed that time and time again during the war and during his own presidency. And to talk a little bit about sustainable leadership, because I think that speaks to us now, but right. it, it says something about him being first, what he accomplished, and how he led, and what his, his concerns were. Okay, so Susan the Analyst is, gets very excited about this because um, you think about, um, he was always thinking about the future. I mean, we got all kinds of, Susan, the family member would say, we got all kinds of um, uh, lectures, at, not lectures, but uh, opining at the dining room table about the future. And if you also look at his speeches, grandchildren are always mentioned. Um, because he wasn't referring to us, he was referring to our grandchildren. We have to be thinking for the future. I mean, he liberates uh, the concentration camps and then makes sure every bit of it is, is uh, chronicled because he said in 50 years from now, no one would believe that this had happened. So he's always thinking um, into the future. And, and, he, and he, I don't want to interrupt you, but no. he, he did that as he was touring as he was the touring in a, in a state of complete shock, yeah. right, yeah. And I'm, I apologize, but it was... No, 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 yeah. but uh, uh, so I think, um, you know, that was, uh, um, you know, to have that, um, that forward-looking, uh, deep um, sense of will this hold up over time uh, was another great accomplishment. So think about it today. The principle of deterrence still exists. This is something created during the Eisenhower administration. I mean, um, there was a lot of talk about it. Um, 
Uh, our strategy for the Soviet Union um, was developed after Stalin's death. Um, uh, part of the Truman um, approach was adopted, but it was multi-layered with other uh, strategic tools to ultimately bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union. That did its job. Um, it, it's just extraordinary how so much of this architecture, including freedom of space and all those other things, how they survived all this time. And um, I, I fear if he were alive today, he would be very worried that everything we're doing is mostly short-term thinking, uh, that it revolves around our um, desire to, uh, to win. In his book, winning would only be um, defined as progress for all Americans. And it helped a lot that he had not been part of a political party um, because at the end of the day, he was probably our most bipartisan president of the 20th century, for sure. And So I, I want to talk about a personal experience that you had uh, <laughs> with him because, again, I think it demonstrates how he, he dealt with the family members, but also kind of in the same way he dealt with his leadership decisions. So if you could tell us about the putting green at Gettysburg. Well, <coughs> so, so thank you very much for your <laughs> earlier question about the loneliness of power. I, w I wanted to say that, you know, even Ike's doctors didn't square with him because, you know, I mean, here is a, you know, the most powerful man on the earth. And by the way, a very, um, I mean, he had wattage. I mean, he had, he had charisma. I mean, he could walk into an empty room and you'd feel like the whole place was full. Um, and so um, I had remarked in that chapter, this is a cameo appearance for me, that um, my, uh, his horses that I rode for him um, plowed up his golf green that he had had put in there so that he could have the privacy of putting at the Gettysburg Farm. Um, and I was, I was devastated. It took us about two hours to round up these horses. I, it had been completely my responsibility, and I had to go in and face the music. And he was known, to, I mean, he was a very passionate man, but he was known to, um, you know, sometimes lose his temper. I never saw much of it as a kid, but I had heard that this could happen, and I was terrified. And when I got to the door of the sun porch, he'd watched the whole thing. He, he saw my face. And I must have looked shattered. And he got, he put on this big smile and he said, you know, as I said to your grandmother, wow, what a scene. He said, I haven't seen horses run like that since I was a kid in Abilene, Kansas. And I said, well, granddad, I'm, I'm completely responsible and I'm terribly sorry. And I got another big broad smile. Actually, in the Eisenhower family, taking full responsibility is a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so we just have a couple of minutes, and I'd like to ask you to read something. I, I know that this might be hard, but this is a statement from Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, about your father, or your grandfather after he passed away. So and Dwight we'll Eisenhower, the Republican president, this is written by Lyndon Johnson, his... Um, you know, who was the leader of the Senate at that time, he, he wrote, a giant of our age is gone. Dwight D. Eisenhower began his service to his people as a soldier of war. He ended as a crusader for peace. For both, he will long be remembered by a scarred but hopeful nation, a hopeful world, a world that loved him well. The sturdy and enduring virtues, honor, courage, integrity, decently, decency, all found eloquent expression in the life of this good man and noble leader. I treasured him always as my close and lasting friend. America will be a lonely place without, uh, um, without him, but America will always be a better nation, stronger, safer, more conscious of its heritage, more certain of its destiny, because Ike was with us when America needed him. So thank you. I know that was hard, yeah. but uh, it's a great way to end. This is a great book and a great person. Well, so thank you. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>